Hello, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome. How y'all doing today? Are you ready for a, a very fun, unique, and lovely event at Yale? All right. Um, uh, today we really, have, on behalf of the Yale SOM Dean's Office and the Yale Center for Business and the Environment, um, we're thrilled to have a conversation between uh, Stella McCartney and Indra Nui. Uh, this is, you know, welcome to everyone across Yale, to all the community partners and folks from around New Haven who've joined us. It really is an honor to have you here for this. Um, you know, it's weird to inhabit a moment when you get to like inhabit a cliche that these two people need no introduction and you can actually say that and it'd be very real, um, like two Brazilian soccer stars, Stella and Indra. Um, and you know, this is, they have a global presence um, and incredibly, you know, wonderful, engaging people. Um, you know, Stella is the founder and creative director of Stella McCartney. Indra is the former chairman and CEO of PepsiCo, and she's a 1980 graduate of the Yale School of Management. You see all this, you see the global present, the impact, the products that they put out, the books that they write, the businesses that they run. What you don't see on the unseen side is just the way that they, the grace and care and decency with which they engage with everyone they interact with. And when you get to organize one of these, you get to exhibit and see that um, on a consistent basis. And Indra is a dot on the horizon for many people across Yale, um, but she also is somebody who treats every single person on the personal side with an incredible sense of grace and decency. Um, Stella, if you walked across campus with her today like I did, you just got to see the legions of people who are inspired and engaged and who deeply appreciate how for 20 years she's been trying to change one of the most challenging toughest industries in the world, and she continues to be at it and continues to inspire a new generation of people to come along. So we are deeply, deeply grateful that the two of them have made time for this, that Indra has helped set this up. Um, and please join us on stage, Indra and Stella. Good evening. Terrified. <laughs> As you should be. <laughs> yeah, it's all your fault. Oh, well, <laughs> my fault. We'll talk about that. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to this uh, amazing event with an amazing person, Stella McCartney. I have to share a little story about what happened about you and this visit and today. I must have changed clothes about 15 times today <laughs> because I said, am I wearing the right clothes to be sitting next to Stella McCartney? Yes. Yes. I didn't know that before I got here. I mean, so. they're not Stella McCartney, which is the only I did have a Stella McCartney to wear, but that was my daughter's. I thought if she saw a picture of this, she'd get mad with me. So <laughs> I didn't want to take one of hers. And then I have to tell you another story. I have a niece who goes to Yale College. And uh, a couple of months ago, I told her very excitedly, you know, Sir Paul McCartney is coming to speak at Yale. And she just looked at me and said, is he related to Stella McCartney? <laughs> So you see, I just want you to know that the reason Sir Paul McCartney is relevant and cool is because of you. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but uh, thank so, you. No, You're I mean it. Me. To the young You're people, that's kind. the only reason he's relevant. So I, I'd like you to tell your dad that. Oh, my God. Yeah, I don't know if I'll tell him. I'll let you tell him. So I thought we'd do our talk today in three parts. The first part, we'll talk about Stella McCartney, the person, how you grew up, how did you get into fashion. The second part, we'll talk about what you're working on right now, this whole area of sustainable fashion. And then the third part, we'll step back from it all and say, can fashion be sustainable at all? Can we reuse, recycle, you know, mm -hmm. repair? Can we really set up a virtuous circle with fashion, which seems to be accounting for so much of the carbon footprint of mm -hmm. the world today? Yeah. So let me start with Stella McCartney, the person. How was it growing up a McCartney? Did you sing Beatles songs all day? <laughs> We listen to them a lot. It's almost as surreal as being interviewed by you, by the way. Can I just have a moment to say what an incredible woman, like how epic. I'm so honored. Seriously. I mean it. Um, yeah, growing up in the McCartney household was pretty surreal. It was full of extremes, I would say. We grew up, um, my mother was American, and um, so I had half British, half American, and I grew up on, on an organic farm in a time where we were actually part of a pilot scheme as a family in England. There weren't, pi there weren't organic um, farms and there was an association called the Soil Association and my mum and dad were part of it very early on um, in the 1920s, that's how old I am. <laughs> and um, it, 
basically, so I grew up on a farm and I went to a, a local state school, a comprehensive school. Um, and then, so it was half of my life. And then the other half of my life, I was on the road as a, as a you know, the child of my, my father's band with my mum in it. And so it would be these very extreme situations. One moment I'd be at home, you know, doing my homework and going to school on a bus. And then the next weekend I'd be with David Bowie in a stadium with 200,000 people. So it was pretty weird. Hmm. My life's been pretty odd. And who are the big musicians you got to meet? <laughs> It's more like, what are the big musicians I didn't get to meet? Oh, okay. Let's leave it right there. Okay. So then how do you uh, go from, did, wait, did you ever want to be a musician? Yeah, I think I, I think now I can safely say, like I would never have admitted it in the past so much, but I think I, I felt it was the more natural thing for me to do. It was more like in my blood and in my bones, you know, being musical and being surrounded with music 24-7. Um, it's something I always enjoy, not really, I can't really play an instrument, but I, I'd like to sing and stuff. So I kind of did, I toyed with the question of, of going into that area, but then I thought very early on that that was not something that I wanted to do, purely because I'm not, if you can believe it or not, I'm not particularly good at being the center of attention, like this mm. isn't my favorite thing to do, I'd prefer to be designing or slightly behind the scenes, but also um, I didn't want to give anyone the option of kind of, you know, shooting me down or having a really obvious conversation. Hmm. It was before the Nepo kid thing was a big oh. conversation. <laughs> you can always uh -huh. do it again. So you <laughs> grew up in this amazing, uh, talented family, and then you branch out on your own to be a fashion designer. What was the first thing, uh, that first experience that you recall where you said to yourself, man, I could be a, a fashion designer or a designer of any sort? Well, I knew that in that question of asking, did I ever want to go into the same field as my, my parents, I knew early on I didn't want to be a child of privilege that didn't know what they wanted to do. I was afraid of not knowing what I wanted to do. And I knew that I loved fashion. I knew that I was passionate about that. And I'd grown up watching my parents wear stage clothes. And like I saw glamour and kind of the you know wings and kind of 70s, 80s kind of you know rock. And then more natural things on a farm. So I knew early on that I wanted to do it. And I started from a very early age. Like I made my first garment when I was 12. I went and oh. studied um, and interned in Paris when I was 15. So I started early. Um, and actually then I went to a, a school in England, a college in England called St. Martin's, which really I think is still the best school for fashion in the world. Oh. Um, and then when I left school, I had my degree show and I got asked to sell my collections. And so I knew fairly early on, with, I, didn't in, I, I always knew I wanted to have my own brand. And I think I always had a vision of, of quite a clear path that I wanted to, to have. But I knew quite early on in my career, it just happened that I, I was lucky enough to, to do it early on. So the fashion world is full of carcasses. I mean, a lot of people try, they don't make it. Uh, at what point did you realize I've landed? What's the first show you did or the first thing you designed that you realize, man, I'm going to be taken seriously and I think I'm going to make it. Oh my God, it's like she's still asking me questions. I'm still here. This is really happening to me. It's really interesting. <laughs> um, I can't believe you're asking me that question. This is crazy. I, um, I think it's just happening now, in all honesty. You know, yeah. I started, I did had my first job when I was 25. I went to Paris and I worked at a house called Chloe and I had very successful shows. And then I started my own brand in 2001. Hmm. And I didn't feel taken seriously for the majority of my career. I mean, I guess the beginning, it's hard because first, and I was always, all my headlines, all my reviews, were like, oh, she got by with a little help from her friends or with a little bit, you know, they were always my dad's song titles, mm -hmm. all my reviews the next day. I was like, oh, you know, with a little love. I'm like, what, like, why is this happening? And then, so that was that. And then I realized a lot of my career I wasn't taken seriously and that not only, at one stage it was like I was the daughter of someone incredibly famous and I didn't have permission to be in that room. But then I was a vegetarian in an industry that's made out of animal skins that sells all their bags and shoes from leather and I was not doing leather and I was like, then I was weird for another reason. Mm. I had two reasons that were like not allowed. And so I either felt kind of ridiculed or not taken seriously for quite a period. And I, but, and yet my work sold and that's really how you know if you're doing okay. And my grandfather, who on my American side, always used to say staying power. That was mm. like his saying. And it really stuck with me. And I think it's, so it's now that I still have a business, that I've been here. Like you say, the industry is brutal. 
It's a brutal industry mm -hmm. and not many survive and certainly female founded businesses are very, very rare. Very few women in the industry um, and at the head of, you know, the face of. So I think now, but more in my recent years, especially now that sustainability is taken seriously and there's the conversation of trying to look after the planet whilst you're in business is something that you can have now with meaning. Hmm. So I'm not a Stella McCartney groupie as yet, but I have to tell you, when I first talked about talking with you to a group of friends, they talked to me about this blue dress that flowed with the body and have you ever worn that? It's just awesome. <laughs> designed by you yeah and then I kept looking at your Instagram pictures and there was a, a green skirt and blouse a dress you wore with Prince Charles telling him to make fashion more sustainable that was a killer King outfit. Charles King Charles <laughs> he was Prince Charles yeah well, wait, I'm being very particular he was Prince Charles then it just sounds great to say King you know now <laughs> but that, that outfit was a killer outfit so some of the stuff that uh, Stella's done is just it's not good it's just awesome Simply thank awesome. you, thank you. Yeah. But you know the thing, thank you, that's ridiculous, thank you. But I, I think, um, look, you know, the, what I do, it's weird, you know, I wanted to be a fashion designer, it was just, and this conversation wasn't, there, were no, there was no connective tissue between the fact that I wanted to not eat meat and not kill animals and not make a product from a dead animal, and there was no connection between that and the environmental, there was mm. no conversation. It was just that I was sort of a veggie and a little bit of a hippie and I wanted to be nice to the planet. But then there was actually a, um, a UN report written in around like 2015 and um, it, was, it exposed animal agriculture and, and mm. the greenhouse gases and it all of a sudden was an eye opener. It's when my father and my sister and I founded Meat Free Monday and it's mm. from that moment on it was like, wow, the impact of killing an, a, a cow cutting down a rainforest, using the water, using the electricity, using the, like, the transport, it all started to make sense. And from that moment on, those dresses had so much more importance to me than just looking fabulous. It was like, I've got to make everything look even more fabulous because if it doesn't, it won't make an impactful change. Like, I need to be representing this conversation in my industry. And in order to do that, I have to have a business model that works and I have to make fashion that stands shoulder to shoulder with the rest. But are you an outlier talking about this these days, or is it becoming more mainstream to talk about, you know, sustainability in fashion? Uh, you know, really thinking about ethical ways to, you know, deliver products. Uh, it's more mainstream now, but the, you know, there's. I mean, it was great before I came here. I met some of the students. I can see some of them in here actually, yeah. um, and <laughs> you know, this is an, an, an. This is what this generation of people are talking about. If they don't, then we're really screwed, you know? And that is, I think, more and more, you're gonna see that in an incredible college like this, that this is the, the future of business. And I think it doesn't matter what business you're in. You know, at the end of the day, the fashion industry is one of, it's the second most harmful to the, yep. to, the, to the world, which is astonishing. But every industry, unless you conduct it with a level of, of you know, sustainability at mind and, and, and conscience, there will, every, every industry has to swap out for this conversation at some stage. Um, but I think it is, there's a movement for sure. There's a lot of greenwashing, unfortunately, in my industry. A lot, you know, people know they have to represent this within their brand, but fast fashion is a killer. It's every mm. second, a truckload of fast fashion is buried or burnt, like every second, every second. Uh, I think less than, people wear fast fashion less than three times, it, you know, before they throw if it away, that many, if yeah. that many. I mean, the statistics are, are really quite horrendous. So it's a conversation. There was an article this morning, had. I don't know how many of you read about Shein and one of the other companies where, um, you know, you get t-shirts for $5 and dresses for something. Yeah, uh, there's no value. A little more than that and yeah. two, two times, you wear it twice and throw, throw it away. The question is, you can sit back and say, yeah, but it's going to landfills where we send all our waste back to Asia. So it's this, uh, you know, virtuous circle, but it's yeah. not. Uh-uh. Um, but the amount they sell is staggering. Uh, it's the most visited website of all websites, the Shein website. So you can imagine how much people are buying. Uh, let me ask a show of hands. How many of you here look at sustainability when you buy fashion? Be very honest. Yeah, be honest. Seriously, there's not an SOM phenomenon, really. Yeah. I, That's I, pretty good. That's a pretty it's good pretty good. I would hope yeah. so. Jesus Christ, I'm at Yale. If, it do, if, that hand, if that show of hands doesn't go up at Yale, then we are really in trouble. We really are in trouble. That's true, yes. But I think that um, I say that a lot. You know, I, get, I think it, it's such a, such a complicated conversation. And I think for me, whenever I'm having it, 
the power of the consumer is the most critical thing. And I think you can ask so many questions about what am I doing and how did I get here? And look, but actually, for me, it's like I, ser I am in the service industry. Mm. I serve people. I'm not, you know, I think in the fashion industry, we're so snobby and we're sort of looked down on everyone. But for me, I'm like, I want to know what you want. Tell me what you want. I'll do it for you because I want you to buy me and I want you to buy into my brand because it's so much better than every other option. And I need, you know, if, if you guys make the choice. And I think that consumers don't realize they have the power. You know, they and they're not informed enough. There's not enough information here. I I spend so much time just trying to give a light touch of information in in my work so that people can have a better knowledge of of their consumption. So we'll come to sustainable fashion and talk about what do we need to do with the consumer pull in order to make sustainable fashion more mainstream. But the problem is now with social media and Instagram and all of that stuff, everybody feels they have to showcase themselves in the best way. And if they wear the same outfit three or four times, nobody's going to like them on social media. And so we, we're seeing a lot of young people actually get messed up because they can't buy the, the latest fashions and look mm. absolutely cool. And when you have that part of society shaming people who don't change their clothes all the time, hopefully the metaverse will allow you to change clothes in your avatar or something mm -hmm. like that. I don't know mm -hmm. what's gonna happen. When that's happening on one side, on the other hand, we're saying, don't fall for fast fashion. Yeah. You know, reuse, repair, recycle, renew, resell, do whatever. Mm -hmm. I think it's two conflicting messages we're giving young people. And I don't know how we're gonna get out of this, but I think it's a real challenge in society. I think and that's in everywhere in society. It's in every aspect, these two conflicting conversations. I guess information, I, all I can hope is that information helps people find where they truly fall. And, you know, education, giving people an education to have an understanding of what's really happening and that they have a choice. You know, I think it's, I've always struggled with the conversation of fast fashion and luxury fashion, mm. especially with people, you know, assuming, well, obviously I've grown up with, with a level of privilege that I could afford, you'd think I would afford those things. But I was saying earlier, actually, I, my mum and dad, one of the great things they did is they didn't give us loads of money growing up. And so I used to just buy vintage clothes or, you know, secondhand clothes. I'd go into thrift stores. And for me, it was okay because there was a level of, I was to some level stylish. And, you know, I liked that it was, you know, I was creating my own style. But that's not often, you know, there is a huge pressure on people to look a certain way. I mean, I hope there's a little bit now where people in the public eye are starting to rewear something twice, God forbid, or, you know, there's a bit of that happening. You know, uh, I had two experiences where for a red carpet, I wore the same dress one year and then the same dress two years later. And one of the photographers stopped me and said, I was going into a black tie dinner. He stopped me and said, Mrs. No, you wore this dress two years ago. Why are you wearing it again? I need yeah. new pictures. Huh? I looked at him and said, who the hell remembers that I wore this two years ago? <laughs> Obviously he did. And then the second was when I first became CEO, I was on the cover of the local Greenwich magazine, Greenwich, Connecticut magazine. And the lady in the local store called me and said, why didn't you tell us you're gonna be on the magazine cover because you wore a jacket from last season as opposed to this season. Yeah. I go, I love that jacket. But they were offended that I wouldn't come to that store and say, they couldn't sell it. I'm, only, I'm gonna be on the uh, cover and can you give me a jacket to wear? So there's huge pressure on everybody to sort yeah. of live up the times and really showcase whatever we have to showcase. Yeah, there but is. Let's come to sustainable fashion. Don't ask me to answer that one. 10% of yeah, carbon emissions are all from um, fashion, if mm -hmm. you want to call it, in some shape or form. And there's so much is being written about uh, asking people to reuse, recycle, renew, resell, do all of that stuff. Yet I look at real, real struggling. Yeah. I look at all the reselling sites struggling. I look at all the rental sites, you know, Rent the Runway, and those guys not doing that great. Yep. Um, I see more clothes going into landfills. A fast fashion, of course, is killing the industry. And most people are expanding their closets as opposed to shrinking them. And when the closets don't have any more space to be expanded, they build an addition to the house to build a bigger closet. If you talk to any of the builders, they will say that is the single biggest building project people are doing adding to the closet for clothes. And then you store them all, you keep all these clothes and look at them. How are we gonna break out of this terrible, terrible addiction? I have it yeah. too now. Yeah. How do we break out of that addiction? Because 
just a few weeks ago, I gave away all my work clothes, I think 100 suits and jackets and dresses, and just gave it away. But why did I buy them in the first place? They were all did black. Did you feel dresses. like you had to? <laughs> that was what, that, that's what freaked me out. <laughs> now, most of them were black dresses or blue dresses. In the dark, you couldn't tell which was black, which oh was blue. Oh my god. I could have bought three black or four black dresses and gone so through wait. my 12 years of CEO oh. with that. Jeez Louise. When you, um, when you gave them all away, did you instantly think, I've got 100 dresses to buy now? Or did you go, this is ridiculous, oh, no, no, I'm no, in a lockdown? I'm not buying water. anything more. Yeah. Unless it's a Stella McCartney. Yeah. And I'm <laughs> And even then, just buy it on the real reel. I give you full permission. I'm happy for that. <laughs> no. I want to, I want, my daughter has a coat hanging in her closet with beautiful designs on it. It's so unique that if I wear it and there's a picture, she'll say you stole it from my closet. <laughs> so I have to be a little bit careful not to make it too unique. Yeah. And then just for I'll you guys, into mine, I right? tried another Stella McCartney in my shelf, and you know which one it is. It's a black T-shirt with tassels. Oh yeah. Oh, it's gorgeous. But then it, I look too damn cool. Oh. I thought you guys, you guys might think I'm a fake walking in, an old lady looking like oh a young chick. Oh my God. Chick. You're and, ridiculous. Uh, I said no. But I'm so but glad. It's really, really beautiful. It flows with you. It's I know exactly the one that you mean. And it's that one, and I'm detouring because her question was so difficult to answer. <laughs> what I'm doing is I'm going to take that fringe top that she's talking about, and I'm going to talk about the material that it was made in. Yes, so please. basically, that took um, us three years at Stella McCartney. So basically, the problem that we have is we're not, I've been talking to some of your students here, because I told them I was going to repeat myself, and now I'm doing it, which I hate. But um, I think one of the biggest problems that these conversations always land on is this is a, a, a conversation on policy change. Mm -hmm. This is, it has to, um, it, you know, we have to change the legal system in fashion and there have to be parameters put on our industry. At the end of the day, it, you know, if you're not telling the, an industry that doesn't have a core value system, and humans don't have the biggest core value system really when it comes down to business, mm. you just have to tell them they're not allowed to do it. Now, it happens in the automobile industry. You're, everyone's been told if they don't go electric by a certain date, they're going to yeah. have a fine, and there's just no other option. We have to have those same you know, policies put onto fashion, I think, at the end of the day. And an example of that is um, the top that you're talking about is made from, um, from rayon, Hmm. And does it, I know that actually in this room, I won't even ask you because I hope in this room you all know what rayon's made out of, but rayon is made out of tree pulp. Mm -hmm. And I was so shocked to find out that when I'm buying materials, you know, I buy and source materials and I couldn't buy a recycled rayon. I couldn't, mm. there was not one on the market that I could buy because they were cutting down over 150 million trees a year and not replanting them. And mm. I didn't have anything that I could buy that would make a top as beautiful as that, that would mm -hmm. wrinkle, that would be quality, that would last forever, would have a value to it to resell or to keep or pass on down to your daughters and grandchildren. And so at Stella McCartney, I took three years of my own time, my own money, my own team, mm. and we found and sourced um, a sustainable forest in Sweden. Mm. And we took the same wood pulp. They cut down the trees, but we replanted the trees. And we took that same pulp and we took it to a, the same um, beautiful mills in Italy and we, we wove that fabric. Now, I wasn't incentivized to this day. Uh, my business didn't get a tax cut for mm. in, in finding that solution for the industry. We didn't get, you know, we're still taxed up, up to 30% when we bring a non-leather good into America. Mm. And um, we're penalized. And so I guess in answer to your question, at the end of the day, you can't put that guilt and that weight onto a consumer because if you do it in fashion, you have to do it in food. I mean, every yeah. single industry, people are still buying cars. They're not, in, they're not encouraged to buy a second-hand car unless it's like a Bronco from 1970. And then you have to change the engine to electric. Like, it's not even affordable. Mm. So I feel like so the only way begin? is law. But where do we begin? Where do we, where do we start animals. with regulation, legislation, whatever? Animals, you have to stop killing billions of animals for leather. And you and I are vegetarians, so we can say that. Well, yeah, but it's a reality, and somebody has to face it at some stage. It's not something people don't want to be told. Look, as long as you're not compromising a product for it. Mm. I mean, my shoes are vegan. These are old, actually. These are not current Stella McCartney, and there's better materials that we have that are more authentic. But they're, you know, I made these six years ago, and I don't think that you would say that doesn't look like leather, or, you know, like, is it compromised? It's better than leather. Thank you, thanks. Um, <laughs> but the point being is, is it's okay because we're not taking away a, a right. People, mm. if you can, and that's where technology and 
is such a big answer to this problem, and the SOS fund is such a big part of that for me, is when we can grow leathers in labs and we can grow meat in labs, you're not telling someone that they can't have that right, mm. and they're not being, you know, the, the taste or the quality is not being removed from them. It's just we need to create alternatives. I saw you tell Prince King Charles uh, that he, he has to legislate, I mean, he has to regulate the fashion industry. Mm -hmm. What did you want him to do? And did, can he do anything? Did he do anything? He can't do anything now. He's king, that's for sure. And no, he, he, he can't do anything. It's the legal, it's this royal system that we have in Britain. And, and you know, that is what it is. It's a whole other conversation. That's another conversation. Um, but he, he comes back. He you know? does have a huge impact. And he has been, you know, whether you like him or you don't like him, he's been doing this for the majority of his life mm -hmm. before it was fashionable, like myself. And um, he's very knowledgeable and very supportive of, of this part of the conversation in business. And um, he has the ear of some of the most influential people mm -hmm. on the planet. So yes, to that extent, he can do something. And he is doing something. And I went to COP, I went to G7, I'm like, well, I went to COP, I went to G7, where did I go? Um, I was at G7 with him. Mm -hmm. And um, I was with the world leaders. And it was because of him getting that time in G7 he, it wasn't me who was able to get Biden mm. and Macron and, you know, Trudeau, all those people for a moment. So he has influence for sure. But I have a suggestion, you know, Prince William's Earth Chart Fund. Mm -hmm. Maybe we add a sixth column because they have five areas mm -hmm. like oceans, air. Mm -hmm. Maybe we ask him to add a sixth one for fashion. Yeah. Sustainable fashion. I think it's worth yeah, doing yeah, because it's part of the whole environment and the yeah. Earth Chart. I mean, I think the thing with fashion that, I didn't know naively, but why, how was I to know at 12 when I wanted to do it? It's one of the few industries that touches on every resource. Absolutely. It's like you sit and you go, and that's why it's one of the most harmful. You, you know, from, you, you, I'm working with farmers, I'm working with land, I'm working with water, I'm working with energy, I'm working with shipping, I'm working with design, I'm working with paper, like every, you know, and human rights, and you know, every aspect of a business that you can think of comes pretty much into the fashion industry. Yeah, but most of the stuff you read about sustainable fashion talks about reuse and recycle mm -hmm. and repair and resell. Mm -hmm. They barely talk about material sourcing. Yeah. And nobody talks about human rights in the supply chain, especially because it's mostly women who are involved. So when women are involved, nobody talks about human rights. Well, it's a dirty industry in that respect. And, and it's, that's where law has to come in. That's the on, only answer I have. And that's really what I'm focusing on. I, and I'm really need help from colleges like this because you know making the yeah. policy change for me is critical and I took away that from G7 because I was with the head of Heathrow Terminal 5 and he was there to basically get a policy in about biofuel and I was like I need to do what he's doing and it's you know I need five words and if you can all help me but um it, it's critical and and um it's exciting but it is it has but to be you're sourcing globally how do you change laws in so many countries? Yeah. That's a real challenge. Absolutely. Because if I look at a country like Bangladesh, where people need the jobs, you can't take it away from people whose whole livelihood is no, you know, that course. very low minimum wage they make. Yeah. And if we now start to dictate that the wages have to go up and you take away their livelihood, it raises an issue. Okay. And so you know, this is a thorny issue which has a solution, but nobody knows what the solution is. But I think you have to take stepping stones. I mean, if you talk about animal agriculture and fashion, you talk mm. about the human rights there, you talk about tanneries all around the world Tanneries, and the yeah. chemicals that are used to tan leather so that it doesn't biodegrade, mm. it's been proven to be cancerous to the people yeah. that work with that, you know? And that, if that was a law that you couldn't use that chemical or you couldn't, you know, or a diff th those are the kind of laws that could be implicated probably a little bit quicker you know, like pharmaceutical laws, I presume there's a little, but they, I don't know, the fashion industry just needs to be called out. It's interesting that you have a lot of people acting against animal testing and pharmaceuticals and things like that, but not as much rabid action on, sustain, on lack of sustainability in fashion, especially think, the leather industry. You know, I always say, and I, I, I always say there's three like really dark industries on the planet. Mm. And arms, drugs, animal agriculture. Mm. You don't see documentaries like you know you're not going to get as a journalist. 
access to the arms industry mm. to do your documentary. You know you're not going to get access to the drug industry and you are not going to get access to the animal agriculture industry. You are, you know, it's like animal activists have to break in at night to a salmon farm. Like that is dark. And yet the fashion industry, which is supposed to be so glamorous and so fabulous and so light, is basically relying on that darkness. And I'm not having it. <laughs> yeah. Look, I think I think what we need is a lot more Stella McCartney's in the fashion business, which we don't have today, to be honest, because leather is becoming even more mainstream. Prices are going up, which means it's becoming more desirable. I mean, everybody wants a Birkin bag. I don't know why. Apart from Paul Birkin, she's like, give me my name back. She's mortified because she's like an animal activist. She's like, you stop using my name. Are you Hermes, yeah. Oh. Like, it's such a sad reality. But, you know, the, the prices, not that I want to buy it, the prices just keep going up. Uh, and I look at this and I go, you know, all the animal activists yeah. are right, but leather's looking more and more desirable because... But that's technology. That's where I just have to have hope. I have to have hope that with the fund, for example, that I can lean into, you know, we... Tell I, them about the fund, Stella. Well, I'm not here to pitch the, the fund, fund, by the way. Yeah. Like, every time, I'm like, don't, I don't want to talk about the fund. Please, when please people talk, talk about, about the fund. It's I'm a good like, one. Ugh. But the fund is, it's SOS, it's, it's called, um, it's Sustainable Solutions. And mm -hmm. basically, for me, my whole career has been about finding a solution to my dilemma yeah. as, a, as a businesswoman in fashion. And I've had to develop all of the things that I'm working with now. I've had to find a regenerative cashmere. I've had to do a pilot with a regenerative cotton. I've had to make this viscose. I've had to find so many solutions to my problems. Mm. And along the way, I've worked with such incredible young businesses or startups. Some are in the room, actually, Protein Evolution. And one of the founders is a Yaleite. He's in the room. He maybe, maybe had more impending issues. Um, but I basically found myself having to solve the problems, working with my supply chain so closely. And then I was, so I was working with them, mentoring them, creating the product. Then I'm buying the product. Then I'm promoting the product. Then I'm making something with the product. Mm. So I was like, I need to close the loop. This is linear and this feels wrong. Mm -hmm. I need to close the loop. So that's what sustainable, it's what it is. The SOS is basically trying to find these new technologies and young businesses that can change the future of fashion. So I got a call, I got an email from a chap called Arthur <laughs> who said, uh, you know, so somebody asked me to reach out to you. Would you talk to me about uh, nutrition or food or sustainable fashion? And uh, I said, sure. I mean. Whoever introduced you to me, I know I respect that person, so I'll definitely talk to you. And he said, Stella and I would like to talk to you. I said, who's Stella? And he wouldn't tell me who Stella was until a few minutes before the call. He said, oh. Stella McCartney. I said, oh. And and I, wish, I wish I had known I'd have gotten some makeup on and tried to look spiffy, <laughs> none of that stuff. And we had a lovely uh, great. Zoom call. We are meeting for the first time today. We just have Zoomed with each yeah. other. So Arthur, is Arthur Donald, who graduated from Yale College, who was Stella's nephew, who works with Stella. Spectacular kid, yeah. I must say, spectacular I'm kid. I'm so lucky to have So him. of all of these ideas you've seen, what's excited you the most? Underappreciated idea that's on the horizon? We have two that are meaningful. One is protein evolution that I was talking about, that we're yeah. doing a, we're doing our, we're in our R&D stage, and we're basically trying to, with their technology, which is an amazing non-chemical technology that's breaking down, um, well, you know. Not fly, you mean? Oh, I know which one. This of is course, yeah, 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 I do. Don't confuse me because no, this I'm is sorry. like where I go, really, is this is not my job. I just want to go yeah, and yeah, make I know pretty exactly shoes. Which one you're like, what the about. hell? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I have to remember so much now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, they're basically, it's very hard to get recycled yeah. materials, and it's because there's a, a most um, garments have a mix mm -hmm. in them. So to extract and um, the two materials is also it prevents garments from being recyclable. So this is a great technology that we're, we're working on a, on a scheme where they, I've given them tons of my dead stock and we're, they're now in a process of trying to pull it apart. So uh -huh. that's, it's really exciting, that, that's one technology. And then Miram is another that I think, believe you were talking about before, yeah, yeah. that um, we just showcased on the runway in March. Mm. Um, my runway was 93% sustainable or in the 90s, which is my most sustainable show to date. So mm. I'm going up in the right direction. Um, and we made the first ever Falabella bag out of Miram, which is a, it's a non-plastic based plant, like a leather. Um, it's completely natural, made out of a rubber 
and it's great. And actually, this is my, this is where the fund comes into place, as I put it on the runway, and then I actually had um, the LVMH group, so I'm sort of infiltrating from within. I don't know if you know, I'm trying to, you know, change the minds of the, of the industry at, at a top level. And I showed them the mirror, and they were like, mm. this is the most brilliant thing we've ever seen. So now I'm super excited that I can hopefully take it into LVMH and, and Just imagine and roll what it the world will be like if there are a few more Stella McCartney. Serious, seriously. Well, I've made spectacular. Four. I've got four kids, so there I'm hoping kids. they're going to do it. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. Questions from the audience? <laughs> Anybody with questions? Yeah, go ahead. Do you have any advice for aspiring mm -hmm. designers or anybody who wants to go into sustainable fashion? Okay. Imagine if you said no, not sustainable fashion, just fashion. <laughs> <laughs> um, advice? Well, th th think about how, if you really want to do it, and if it's really like something you're passionate about, and, and think about what area you want to go into. I always thought I wanted to be a fashion designer. And then when I did my internships, I was lucky enough to meet with a designer. Um, mm. And she said, well, look, let's get you to study different areas of the industry. It's such a hugely, in, in, it's a bit of a sort of gloom and doom conversation. The fashion industry is so brilliant. It's such an inspiring industry. Mm. It's born out of creativity. It's, it's a dream, you know, and if we can make the dream desirable and sustainable, then we win this conversation. It's a beautiful thing to escape into. So look at all areas of the industry and see, because every one of them is so important. Mm. And I think that you, one doesn't know that when you're looking at it from the outside. Lisa, where's Lisa? Lisa, you wanted to ask a question. Whether you want to or not, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> no. she, she, um, Lisa worked with me on my book. Phenomenal writer, extraordinary Your person. Your book is great, by the way. She, she helped write it. Well done, she, Lisa. Yeah. And so Lisa had, she was asking me all kinds of questions on the way up. So go ahead, Lisa. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I can ask you a question. Go ahead, ask me no, whatever. No, no, after no. Lisa, I, I do have a question. Not that um, I'm and and I, since we're going here, I worked at Bloomberg for 22 years and in covering businesses, I found that the fashion industry as a huge industry was not covered the same way as other things in business, shall mm -hmm. we say, from securities firms to tech to all that kind of stuff. And I question whether that was because it is a female dominated in its, uh, it, not in terms of who the executives are, mm -hmm. but in terms of who the consumers are mm -hmm. and in terms of who the people who mm. work in the industry largely. What, like we couldn't handle the reality of it or we were too, in what way? No, and I'm wondering if you think that there has been a bias away from covering the business of fashion because it is has not had the kind of gravitas in the markets and other mm -hmm. places. It's not sexy, so it's not readable. Well, exactly. So the clothes I, I are not the industry. Yeah, you don't want to read about it. You don't want to have yeah. the fashion industry is covered. Um, do I think um, I, I say it again? <laughs> <laughs> Did you I'll, understand I'll be, it? I'll be more. I'll I'll try and ask the question I know in a different mean, way. Though. I I do you think there is some barrier in the media to these issues that you're mm -hmm. talking about? Mm -hmm being yeah, covered the because the way we mm -hmm. are exposed to fashion is through magazines with beautiful ads yeah. and shows it's and all that kind of stuff. read, is what you're saying. In and Bloomberg, so we're not it's like getting fun, enough. serious, scary, and it goes into the fun arts and let's not make, that. let's one of our happy stories and one of our dreamy stories. Um, yeah, I do. And I think that it's important that... Um, the way I was, I, we were talking about this earlier with some of the students, mm. in a sense. Um, for me, it, was, it came in a different way for me, which is do I find it hard to find, but I find it hard to have the balance between a serious conversation like this and still making people be able to escape into the dream of fashion because people don't really want to hear this stuff. Like, you, you mm. know, you associate it with a different part of your daily life and you don't want to be beaten up and told off or be made to feel guilty when you're escaping. So I think that, yeah, there's definitely that aspect. But I, I find, 
because I have to judge that balance of how I inform my customer or how I'm perceived in my industry. I have to always be a bit like, oh, it's okay, you know, here's a pretty dress and don't notice that it's sustainable in a sense. Um, the way I, and this is me being honest, I think the thing that from a journalistic point of view is of interest is the fund conversation. Mm. Like that's, and that's why I gave you the, the printouts today. They're all recycled, don't worry, and the QR code though, will tell you about what I think is the sexy journalistic part of what the conversation is, which is the new, you know, ten that's when you get a little slice of the serious because it's, diff it's so different from every other conversation. They give it column inches. So you have a sense. partnership with LVMH. Mm -hmm. How are you going to leverage that? Well, I'm going to, it's a minority, so I'm the boss. Ish. Mm -hmm. um, not that you ever really can be with Ms. Rano, but I, I like to think that we're in, e we have an yep. equal seat at the table. Mm. Um, and I, it's, it's very easy because he's not an idiot. They're not idiots and they know this is coming. And I have such validity in this comment. You can't argue with the facts and you can't ha dig your head in the sand. And he's not a stupid guy. I'm sure you've met him. He's yep. one of the most, mm. you know, successful men or however you look at success on the planet. And, you know, this is coming. This conversation is coming and I'm his chief sustainable advisor. Mm. So I'm there giving him information and giving him solutions. Because if you don't have the solutions, I don't think it's really, it's exhausting to have the conversation unless you have solutions. So they're actively searching and investing in finding solutions. Well, it's both an that. offensive and a defensive measure for them. So they should do it. And they're in the fund. So yeah. it's like, you know, that's a big sign. And I do think that when Monsieur Arnaud asked to invest in my business, it gave a pretty loud message to the industry. Sure. Other questions? Mr. Rayop, go ahead. Who gets to wear sustainable fashion? Um, and I don't even mean this as from a point of view of a student, but even just like the millions of people that live in developing countries all around the world who, who need to, everyone needs to wear clothes, right? Yeah. Um, so do you envision just kind of like people who have more means in wealthier countries subsidizing the sort of way unsustainable fashion that people who can't afford it have to wear because you know one Stella McCartney coat is probably what a person earns in a month or more in you know a country mm -hmm. like where, where my family's from for example so what is your vision really and you take into account not just how wealthy countries and, and wealthy people within those wealthy countries um, consume fashion but also in a more globalized um, vision that takes into account inequalities between mm -hmm. um, people mm -hmm. in and countries as well I mean hell that's life you know what I mean? Like that is a hard question to answer because that is a reality and it, it's a huge question. But all I can say is it, you can draw that into nearly every product on the planet. And from my personal experience, I think you have to lead by example. So when you are in the privilege and when you do have a voice and when you are talking in this room of people, none of us are that room of people that you're saying, you know, they're hugely affected by this comment. In fact, more affected than any other room. Um, I think that we have to take, I can only take accountability and try and change my industry from where I am, you know, and I think that is, again, it's information, it's giving alternatives. If you, can, if you do have the means, please invest, please don't invest, give away your stuff and give yeah. it away well. I'm not sitting here going bye, bye, bye. The only reason I'm trying to do that is really so that I can swap out an industry and they can look at my business model and go, okay, that is something we could swap into. And if you don't have anyone doing what I'm doing, it will never change because they're never gonna have a solution or you know, it's gonna be a problem that can't be fixed. But I think for me personally, it's, it's, it is about resale, it is about renting, it is about you know, secondhand clothing and being proud about it, making that cool. Like if that is cool, you know, really cool kids don't wanna wear, you know, yeah. cool informed fashion and fashion's about trying to be cool, right? Mm. So you've got to make it cool. It's true. Yep. Thank you so much for coming. It's really wonderful to talk about this. I feel like I've been trying for a long time to think about how to buy sustainably, and maybe that in itself is not sustainable. But um, that is sustainable in itself, of course. <laughs> 
Um, but something I'm thinking about is I'm just about to graduate, and in graduating, I have way too much stuff in my closet, and I have to pack some of it into a box, and then the rest of it I want to give away, and I'm curious to know what is the best way to kind of dispose of the things that you've accumulated to date, and in the next like six months, I'm going to start a new job, start a new phase of my life. What can I look out for besides like a Stella McCartney label on clothes? Like what I'm on the tag? Sell. <laughs> <laughs> what could I look out for on clothes as I think about like buying the next like 10 signature pieces of my wardrobe? Good question. Okay, it's two questions. Um, first one, I would say give to charity shops. Give, give, I mean, in England, we call them charity shops. Here, you call them thrift store. Like, I don't know, give mm. them to a, somewhere that when they sell it, it can go to a good cause. Um, and also, in, in the next part, I would say invest wisely. I try to design, I think one thing, even if you're not a sustainable designer, you can design timeless pieces so that they don't go in and out of fashion, so that they have a timeline and a lifespan, that your wardrobe is really should be 10 basic things. I wear the same things nearly all, I mean, I've worn this suit a thousand times, and like people luckily don't even look to me for what I'm wearing, because I'm just always wearing the same thing. But I think that um, invest wisely if you're lucky, you know, I always, I, look, it's easy to say, but I would say don't buy 20 crappy landfill things and buy one good thing mm. and a timeless thing that's designed well, that will serve you well, that you have pride and investment in, that you you feel proud that you could afford it even. You know, you don't have to go crazy. It can already be a secondhand thing, but as long as it's well made and will last you, you can give that to, you can hand that down. Like these, mm -hmm. if fashion... There's a, it, there's a sense that fashion is just so disposable and it shouldn't. It's like as a good investment as a chair. If you buy a great piece of furniture or a great, you know, you need to feel that love and make it an investment in your mind, I think. Yeah. Go for quality, not quantity. Critically important. And I'm telling you, now that I've given away all my clothes, I feel like a new person. Because I walk into the closet and it actually feels like a closet as opposed to something that I shoved in so many black suits. It's just... Like, uh, I, I don't, don't know why I did it. If you're listening to Don't Buy Any Black, that would be, <laughs> don't bother with black. Find out where she gave all these clothes, by the way. I would I, go straight. You know, I, where I, are I you? Tell you, I gave give that information out. 20 boxes of business clothes away to West Point, the academy. They have an exchange okay, program I need for the address. Is there an address, a specific address? <laughs> If you join and if you join the army, you might be able to have, get access to it. <laughs> Besides, and then there's something called Veterans of America. They'll come and pick up all your clothes, and they're a fantastic organization. So cool. after I gave away another 30 or 40 boxes of clothes, I feel like a new person. I marry condoed myself. <laughs> Who had a question there? Go ahead. Hi. Anybody on that side? <laughs> You're not going to go. Are you going to go, go? Or are you going to go? <laughs> Before you go, go. Thank you. Um, and seeing poorer people, one side of my family is very poor, and talking about clothes and sustainability, wearing this, only having two outfits for during the week and two uniforms, and the other part of the family having lots of means, but at the same time, in our country, we have a responsibility to others. So while you do have the clothes, the money actually went to help others. Right. Um, yeah. My children are my first generation here, and I think one of the things I need help with and others need help with, with the cool clothes yeah. um, and the volume of clothes, what vocabulary, what substitutes can we give our children, our friends that buy a lot of things, that little piece of it that will change their minds and hearts mm. um, so that they can be sustainable instead of staying in that same old, same old pattern. Yeah. My parents said, do you want the croquettes or do you want a passport? Yeah. I took the passport and I traveled the world. Um, but not everyone is like that. So Why I do you think you made that choice? Was that in you? You know, like that's the big question is how do you, how people make choices sometimes based on something you can't even advise. I wonder why you took that choice. 
Um, it was the right choice. My, my mother worked at the United Nations. I played at the United Nations. I saw all types of people. So I was interested in maybe going where they went. But you're, you, had an, you had some information in your eye line that yeah. informed your decision. Yeah. I think for me that's the answer in itself. You know, If we can give one little piece of information, like feed, drip, feed, to the next generation that they don't even, they're obsessed with fast fashion or looking a certain way, just every now and again, just plant a little article from the New York Times, you know, on yeah. the coffee table that kind of, I don't know. You know, I think, I think that information is critical and how you deliver information is critical. Thank you. Go ahead. The shot dot. It's you again. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, my name is Raquel, as Sela knows, I'm the founder of Lots of Berries, uh, which is a environmental fashion company based in New York. We upcycle, but we also create fashion accessories made out of biomaterials, specifically mycelium, which is mushrooms. So we are in a funding stage, and I would love to know more about your process, especially in conversations with possible investors and leaders of industry and what you found was effective in kind of convincing them that this is a path to go down. Um, what I mentioned in the meeting before this was during my time working New York Fashion Week as a sustainability ambassador, that was a very hard conversation to have with leaders of industry to kind of convince them that sustainability mm. is important. And for me personally, it was definitely emphasizing profit because people didn't seem to care. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, as someone that I've looked up to since, uh, since I can um, remember and as someone who, microphone, it's like an explosion for me and what I'm doing, what have you noticed over the years was particularly impactful, especially in these days? Oh, nice question, nice comment, I like you. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think I'm just so blown away that this is a conversation. You know, uh, this has only recently become something that people are aware of enough to even have a conversation about. It, it's never, it was never there when I started my career. It was not something that you had permission to talk about. So I think it's fantastic that, you know, I think one of the, the things to watch out about, just be super informed. And you know, you see, you have a passion, you can see that this is what you're gonna do. You can just tell from the minute you stand up. But just be informed and like really find your niche. You know, this now is no longer a niche. When I started, this was like, what, who, ridiculed, made fun of. Now this has such value added to it. You know, my business has, has been the beneficiary of, of the conversation coming into fashion. But you know, this is, a, this is a false economy in my industry. It's a little bit of a fake conversation. So if you can go in with authenticity and you can go in and just be informed and passionate, then you own the room. And mycelium is hot these days. So mycelium, I love a bit of mycelium. Sweet spot. Who has the last brilliant question? Go ahead. All the way in the back, right there. We better be brilliant. This is a tough crowd, guys. You're all like, I'm never going to do a clever room I, again. <laughs> I, I got here very late, and I apologize for the traffic up from New York. But wow. uh, I know from this lovely gentleman sitting next to me that you spoke a little bit about your opportunities uh, at the G3, the G Seven. Summit to, to um, talk about legislation. I am a 30-plus year veteran of our industry in design and production. And I have reverted my career to sustainability. And right now, I've put together um, with folks from NYU Law Guarini Center um, a, legisl a worldwide legislative textile repository and advisory. Because one of the things I personally believe is that the industry isn't going to change until there's a level playing field leveled by legislation. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I'm, I'm looking from you uh, how you feel, which legislation, pieces of legislation are going to, use, in your opinion, be the most effective. And Ms. Noye, would you care to add into that? Because you've led an enormous uh, industry for many years. But I think across all industries, including fashion, uh, legislation is going to be a key 
I think uh, AI and cloud blockchain is going to be a key. Um, and anything that I can help you do, yes, or any of the other brands that may be in here, burgeoning brands, I would be delighted to be associated with you. I also do textile collection and resale, so anyone who needs spare textiles, got a, so let's I've got a container full of them. Any, so. any critical piece of legislation you think would make a difference? You talk about animals. Yeah. So what exactly would the legislation say? I mean, gosh, I mean, ultimately, letting animals not be killed yeah. full stop would be great. That's going to be maybe a little ways away. Mm. Um, for me, it would be about import and export and actually having an, a positive, um, you know, being rewarded for not using an animal product. Uh, whereas now it is a reverse. I was saying earlier, but you probably missed it. We have, I have a tax of up to 30% on, on a non-leather product coming into America, for example. And I actually said it to Kerry and to Biden, and they were like, their faces dropped at G7. They're like, what? I was like, it's probably like a, medi like a law from the beginning mm. of America, like about cattle or something. I think understanding those laws and then understanding to flip it out, that would be my answer personally, because I know that the most meaningful impact at Stella on a positive way on environmentally is the fact that we don't use animal products. So that not only is sort of ethically what I would say, but also from a, from a sustainable point of view, I know it would have the biggest impact. So if taxations went the other way, so if you actually were killing animals, using those chemicals, hurting those people that put the chemicals on the leather skins, giving them cancer, ruining rainforests, ruining the, the, the tax should go on you. I mean, measuring the measuring mm. conversation is huge. There was a lot of that at COP26. There's a lot of that now. And I think it's a really, a COP27, it's a really important conversation. It's how do you measure and how are you then penalized? How, how is the tax, how are you formally made to pay for your negative impact on your industry, especially if you're a big industry? And I think the fact that's a, a great conversation too. So let me just sort of bring this to a close. I think the big issue we're facing is the fact that people don't recognize climate change is a big issue. <coughs> and the fact that, um, there are so many aspects to climate that we have to worry about because they deny the, the problem that climate change poses to the world. So when you have those naysayers who've got a bigger voice and a bigger sort of negative uh, platform, you know, they've now called it all woke. All of a sudden- the, the meat industry has more money, the, meat, the, the I mean, come on, that's so, the so body every, every of, industry has more money funding to call climate the, uh, embracers woke. So when you have this dynamic going on, you're fighting a battle every day. And I think it's gonna take a while to chip away. And I'll speak from my own experience. I managed a company at a time when everybody was talking about obesity. Everybody was talking about water use, plastics. And then you start to make the changes and all of a sudden all those guys disappear. So because they don't believe in it, it was fashionable to talk about those issues for a short time. We have to build a consortium of voices, credible voices that really care about the climate, of which carbon emissions from fashion is an important part, and you have to deal with everything from the supply chain to manufacturers push to consumer poor. It's a massive effort. Um, if you're looking for comprehensive legislation to impact all of it, it's not going to happen, not in your and my lifetime. Uh, so I think what we can do is encourage the Stella McCartney's of the world in the area of fashion. People are working on meat alternatives in the area of meat, you know, animal killing them. And just hope that these multiple ideas will over time, uh, you know, become much bigger industries themselves. And traceability um, is a huge one, you know, like now, you yeah. I mean, when you get such great new technologies where you can get barcodes, you know where your food came from, you need to apply that to my industry. You know, those things need to speed up. It needs to be, you have to say where your garment's made. You should have to say where your garment has come from and tell that journey. The challenge is that change will happen when we have a ca catastrophic event, which forces large scale change. But I don't want that catastrophic Yeah, let's avoid event. that. So we've been telling people it could happen, so we need to make the change. At the same time, we don't want it to happen. And unfortunately with climate, uh, the, when the proof comes, it's too late. And so uh, our hope is that the young people will rise up at some point and make the change. I don't mean rise up in a negative way. Rise up, make your voices heard, 
you know, vote with your feet, your purchases, at the same time, you know, encourage the Stella McCartney's of the world and all the people in the supply chain to actually start making a change by buying differently, sourcing differently. And the whole idea is to go around talking about this uh, to as many places as you can. Stella was just given the Society for Progress Medal for making such a big difference in sustainable fashion. And so a few more Stella McCartney's, a lot more Stella McCartney's, we might be in a much better place. Does that mean I'm the answer to all of these problems? <laughs> So on that, Stella, thank you for coming to the Yale School thank of Management. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. I want to... This, this is just the beginning. Stella will be back many more times to Yale. She loves New Haven. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to sing next time, though, because I'm going to make it a bit more jolly. I'm going to do... I'm going to, you know, come out and... We were going to come career. out dancing, but yeah. then we thought... It's too much. We can go out dancing. We can go out dancing. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank Appreciate you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anytime.